instrument this horn but it was a significant sacrifice for parents on a fixed income and it was enough to get a fourth grader hooked on it and who knew it would lead to everything that you uh, see behind me howdy and welcome to the story of the horn where in the following 28 episodes I will demonstrate these lit blown aerophones one of the questions I get asked frequently is where'd you get all the instruments I remember how I got all of them. There's a story behind every single one, but I think it is important to note that I don't view myself as a collector, and that's simply because I see these instruments as tools to be used, and I feel that the authentic period instruments should be in the care of museums or conservators somewhere. I've always been interested in historical background, and I suspected early on the horn must have had one, but it wasn't until my third year of high school that a college instructor happened to come by, did an after-school recital for about six folks that showed up, but he played the Beethoven Sonata on hand horn, and that was a very impressive thing, at least to me. Now, in my senior year of high school, a friend in an art class made this clay horn for me, and I still have it, and I was very happy to have it at the time as well. After my first year in college, I attended the Hornswoggle Horn Camp by Elliot Higgins, and that year he had Louis Stout as his guest artist. I remember seeing his demonstration from the forest to the concert hall, and I pattern my presentation I take to schools after his From the Forest to the Concert Hall. It was very impressive to me, and I remember thinking back then that that was the career I wanted to have without understanding that no such career actually exists. On a college marching band trip to Hawaii, I saw vendors selling conch shells. And it was at that point it occurred to me that if I purchased one thing a year, after a few years, I would have a number of items. So I eventually disciplined myself so that on years that there was some income, I could get something expensive, or more likely the case, years I didn't have much money, I would buy something I could afford, like this uh, $5 buffalo horn from uh, South Dakota. It was a matter of prioritizing. Uh, it was a hobby, but I rationalized it as being somewhat relative to my job as a horn player. Professor Mary Rasmussen at the University of New Hampshire that convinced me to borrow the school hand horn and do my own Louis Stout type of presentation. So, with my two nieces as my in, I scheduled a presentation at Best Brennan Elementary in Lake Jackson, Texas. And it came off well, I think. But uh, at the end, I always remember a question a uh, fourth grader, I think it was, had asked, where he said, are you trying to show the evolution of the horn? Well, yeah, that was in my head, of course, in organizing how I arranged the instruments. But it did impress me how he was able to pick that up and that apparently I was getting this across effectively. But I also knew that evolution does not travel in a nice, clean, straight line. It's very complicated and messy, especially if you're dealing with a manufactured type item that has cultural influences. So, it made me think, I, I have to find some way to classify instruments better or have more options in future presentations. And fortunately, there are ways of classifying instruments other than chronologically. I've studied geology in the past and have seen that the science fields have very disciplined classification systems and I've attempted to incorporate ideas of cladistics and taxonomy into helping understand the history of the horn a lot better. 
I feel that it is an improvement over the traditional approaches found in, say, musicology and straightforward history. The Hornbostel sock system of classifying instruments works as a good basis for categorizing the horns, but in my opinion it obsesses about silly things like whether it has a mouthpiece or not or vowels and completely does not address what it's made out of and other important things. Uh, what was its purpose? Or iconographical issues. You see, as often as an instrument is performed, it is painted, it is created by somebody in a picture or carving with some idea of what it stands for. This is an important issue that we simply cannot ignore. In my mind, I have a multi-dimensional classification system that accounts for several homoplasies, that is, shared or converged upon characteristics that any instrument could have and could further be placed into different sorts of clades. Now, what does this jargon mean? For instance, this Yemenite shofar could be grouped with other shofars. This is a kudu, this is a gemsbok, and this is an Ashkenazi ram's horn. These are all shofars, but they have obvious different sizes, configurations, textures, and species. We could also put it in the clade of religious functioning instruments, or animal horn instruments, not religious, or instruments made out of anything that is not brass, as you see here, or conical bore instruments, which creates this rather unusual grouping of things we wouldn't normally put together. I've had the privilege over the years of experiencing horns from an anthropological, sociological, theological, and performance perspective that has exposed me to cultural aspects I would not normally encounter. Last September, I was invited here to partake in Rosh Hashanah, and that is quite a privilege to be part of a horn-blowing event that dates back thousands of years. So, it is experiences kind of like that that I hope to impart to viewers uh, like you in the following 28 episodes. So thank you for watching and uh, shalom.